But okay, uh, let's um, let's go ahead and get started this morning. Let's stand up and let's praise God this morning. Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle, and nothing can stand against the power of my God. And, um, <laughs> so when I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you in every field. Lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And oh God, the battle belongs to you. Amen. Go and be seated. All right, well, Hunter is right. We, we, it's kind of an observation, and I, I think I've come up with a, a, a theory of why one side is more than the other. Um, this side over here is where most of our football fans usually sit. <laughs> and so Sunday morning, you're usually nursing a depression from the Saturday previous, and so they're at home with some private prayer time. That means this group over here, I don't know if you're Ole Miss fans or Mississippi State fans, but this is the prayer section over here. So you, you've already made it on the prayer list. No, I don't know why we have one side more than the other. But uh, regardless of who you root for or whether you're licking your wounds from college football yesterday or you're celebrating, we're glad you're here with us this morning. So uh, just a few things before uh, we jump back into our worship. Uh, you can tell things are a little bit different today. 
Uh, we do have the remembrance table set up. We will be observing the Lord's Supper um, as soon as the service is over. Uh, if you are a born-again believer, we would love for you to partake in the Lord's Supper with us. Uh, this is just the way that we worship, and we would love for you to, to worship alongside of us. So, uh, again, that'll be whenever we wrap up the service this morning, uh, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper. Uh, evening service tonight. Uh, this is not our usual schedule, but there will be no evening service because tonight is the annual, I don't even remember what they're calling it now. I believe it's an annual celebration now. Uh, I don't know if that was because they thought annual meetings sounded a little too much like business meetings, so let's call it an annual celebration. But this is uh, for our association, and so uh, that'll be tonight. So some of us are, are, are heading to that. Uh, so the rest of you, you get to take a nap or trade, go hunting. Uh, kill something big for me, as long as you share the deer meat. But uh, tonight, th there will be no services here or anywhere else because uh, we'll be going to that. Uh, out on the bulletin board, we still have a sign-up sheet for Children's Church and Nursery. Uh, we're starting to get a few spots uh, filled, some more people showing interest. Uh, but if the Lord's been laying that on your heart, check that out and pick a date and get signed up. Uh, kiddos, this is one that you're going to love. Next Sunday, it's pumpkin patch time. So make sure you're here. Make sure uh, you're, you're on time. But we'll have church regular Sunday morning, and then you will stay afterwards, and you'll eat lunch here, and then you will depart for the pumpkin patch. And parents, oh, it's going to be wonderful. I, I think the temperature is only supposed to be like 85, 86. Now, I don't know what it is. Um, hopefully, it will be cooler. I can promise you it will be dry. And so when you're out there on that uh, hayride, it's probably going to be dusty. Uh, but uh, the kiddos are going to have a good time, but you're, you're welcome to go with them. Uh, you can see uh, Becky, she's got flyers for all the parents that tell you the different admission prices and what you get for those admission prices. Uh, the church is providing your lunch. You don't have to worry about that, uh, but admission is on you. Uh, but again, that will be next Sunday uh, after church that we'll head, be heading out there for the afternoon. Uh, Halloween is fast approaching, so there's a couple things I need you to know about that. Uh, out here in the back, uh, you've noticed a box. Uh, and it is just labeled, I think, Halloween candy. Uh, we need as much candy as you can possibly bring us because here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to have Halloween at the Preacher's again. Uh, if you've been to my house, you know that Western Pines is a hopping place on Halloween night. Uh, we will see a large proportion of our, our community there that night. And so instead of trying to beg people to come and see us, we're just going to go where they already are. And so that night, we're going to be set up in my front yard, and we're going to be passing out candy and talking to people as they come. Uh, if the Lord gives us any opportunities uh, for gospel conversations, we're going to take them. But uh, meet with us that night at our house. If you don't know where my house is, uh, there'll be a telegram that goes out with that address. Or if you're not good with the, with the whole technology thing, come see me, and I'll give you directions. But uh, we're going to meet to set up Halloween night at 5 o'clock with hopes of being ready by 5.30 and the crowd will be in full swing by 6. And so if you uh, don't have Halloween plans, if you don't really want to pass out candy, come over to our house, hang out with us, and you say, no, I'm just turning all the lights off, I'm not doing anything, well, then bring some candy up here for us so that we can pass it out in your place. But, uh, that, again, that's our Halloween night plans. All right, there's only one more thing that I have, uh, and you need to mark this on your calendar because I want as many people here as we possibly can. Uh, on November 6th, that Sunday evening at uh, 5 o'clock, we're going to be having a deacon ordination. And so uh, we have, for the almost full six months now, have set David Knight and David Kelly aside. They've been having some on-the-job training. You'll see their lovely faces when we do Lord's Supper today. Uh, but on November 6th, we're going to have their ordination service. And so come be a part of that with us, but also stick around afterwards. We're going to have a, a potluck dinner. Uh, the church is going to provide the meat, but we would ask if you have a, a favorite side or a fixing or a dessert that you would like to bring that night, bring that up here, and uh, we'll eat and celebrate them uh, after the service is over. But again, mark that on your calendar, Sunday, November 6th at 5 o'clock. All right, do you all have any other announcements this morning? Yes, ma'am.
But it seems weird that we are talking about Christmas. Okay. It seems weird for y'all that we're talking about Christmas. I've been listening to Christmas music since August, so for me, this, this is fine. But uh, Christmas child, Operation Christmas Child is upon us. Uh, if you remember, they've got to have those boxes packed right before Thanksgiving, so that time's fast approaching. I mean, if you would like to donate items or if you would like to donate money to purchase items, see Kelly or Becky, and they can tell you what we need or uh, what the needs are there and before they start packing. All right, anything else this morning? So inflation has hit postage as well. Yes. All right. Anything else this morning? All right. We'll go ahead and have our ushers come up. We'll take our offering and then uh, we'll move on with our worship service. Stand up and continue to worship. in hell. 
Let's go to God in prayer. Holy God, come to you in prayer. Just thank you so much for this day. God, I just ask and pray that you build our lives, God, and uh, continue to help us grow spiritually, God. God, I pray uh, over the message today. Just ask and pray that we all take it and bear fruit, God. Thank you, God, so much for this day. We are pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, well, thank you all. All right, Miss Becky is heading to Children's Church. So, kiddos, head that way. Gunner, I still like the hair, man. All right, well, I've already kind of touched on it. it just, we're we're going to be really honest with each other for a minute, okay? So, I, I just need you to, to be vulnerable with me. I, I, I usually don't call people out, but I, I just need a, a quick show of hands. Has it been a rough weekend for anybody else? Man, let me tell you, between deer hunting, by the way, I hate deer. I think they laugh behind my back. Between the Razorbacks, which let's don't even get started. I told my brother I was going to start a hotline for uh, fans in crisis where I could provide counseling for like a dollar a minute of how to set these unrealistic and unfounded expectations. I'm like, I'll be able to retire in no time. Between that and then last night, or the last two nights, I got to watch my Cardinals absolutely play like a bunch of little leaguers and walk themselves right out of the playoffs. It's been, it's been a rough weekend, y'all. And as I was thinking about that, in the context of this message, all I could think about was all the mistakes that happened. All the things that, like, in the deer stand, man, if you had just done this different, Maybe the outcome would have been a little bit different. Or as I was watching the Razorback game back and forth because they just toy with my affections and thinking, man, if they had just changed this, if they hadn't have done that, if they hadn't have made this mistake, maybe it would have been a little bit different. As I watched the Cardinals absolutely implode going, maybe if they'd made a different decision here, that would have been a little bit different. But the result was not good in all three of those situations. And it got me to thinking, a lot of times you and I feel that way day to day, don't we? We make a mistake or we've done something, and if we'd just done it a little different, maybe the outcome would have turned out better. But in the end, we feel like we got disqualified, like we just are not even worthy of another shot. And it got me to thinking about that word, disqualified. What's it mean? What does it mean to be disqualified? Well, I looked it up, and here's what the dictionary says. It says, to be declared ineligible for an office, an activity, or competition because of an offense or an infringement. In layman's talk, because we screwed up, we don't get another shot. And a lot of times, that's how we feel, isn't it? We feel like because we've either lied, cheated, we've been in a fight, we've done whatever, that we are disqualified. Now, let's be really honest. In most cases... I can't say all because we could all come up with a, a case where we see somebody do something wrong and go, why did they get away with that and I didn't? But in most cases, when we do something wrong, we run the risk of being disqualified from our endeavor. Now, last week we started talking about the Apostle Paul, and this was a very real concern for Paul. Paul was concerned that because of all of his past, am I disqualified? Do I get a shot at this purpose that God has called me out to? And we see that early on in the Apostle Paul's story, he gets to spend some time in a little town called Damascus. Now, if you've been around long, you've probably heard this story. Paul is on the road to Damascus to do what? He's persecuting the church. He is there with letters of authority to say, I can arrest any Christian that I find, and I'm going to arrest you, and I'm going to bring you back to Jerusalem, and I'm going to put you on trial. And what's the outcome of that trial going to be? The same thing it was for the leaders. They were going to kill him. And so Paul is on his way to Damascus to deliver these letters, and he's going to arrest the Christians that he finds there. But on the road to Damascus, something miraculous happens. Paul has this encounter with Jesus. And you remember how it is. Can you just imagine if you're Paul, you're, you're riding down there on your, your horse or your donkey, whatever he had the, the means to purchase. But he's on the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden, what happens? This light shines brightly. Now, that would be cool enough, right? But it says, then there's a voice 
that comes speaking to him out of this light. And the voice identifies himself as Jesus. And because of this encounter, Paul is blinded. And the voice tells him, says, I want you to go to Damascus. And I want you to sit there and I want you to think about what you've done. You're going to await further instructions. So Paul does. And like I said, he spends some time in this town called Damascus. Now, why he's there, God reveals to him that in the middle of all that's going on, that God has a plan and a purpose for Paul's life. What was it? What was the plan that he had for him? He says, you are my chosen instrument to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, we, we lose something of that in translation. But what God is telling Paul, you are my chosen instrument to take the gospel around the world. You are my chosen instrument to spread the gospel past this little piece of uh, on the map that we call Israel, and it's going to go worldwide. And Paul, I'm going to use you to do it. While he's sitting there in Damascus, the Lord tells him, this is the plan I have for you, Paul. We go, man, that's awesome. This is, this is where the story gets really good. Have you ever thought about what happened in those three days? We know what happened as a result of those three days. Saul becomes Paul. Paul becomes the greatest missionary the world has ever known. The gospel literally does spread worldwide, and you and I are here today because of it. But what happened in those three days? See, I think God was working on Saul's heart, but I think there's something else at work. I think in those three days, in the middle of all that was going on, in the middle of God telling Paul that he had a plan and a purpose for his life, I believe that Satan tries to convince Paul in those three days you're not fit to serve. You're not fit to take place in this plan. And what could Paul argue with? I mean, really. Why was he there to begin with? Well, I, I was here to arrest these people. And now God, you're saying that you want me to be a part of this church? Satan is steadily accusing him and telling him, you don't deserve to be a part of this plan. I know what you're thinking. Preacher. How do you know that? Because I don't, I don't remember that as part of the story. It's not part of the text. But you know how I know it? You know how I know Satan used that same trick with Paul? Because he used it on me repeatedly. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's not just me that he's used it on. He's used it on every single one of you in this room. He's tried to convince you that because of some past mistake, because of some past failure, you're disqualified. You don't get a chance to live out God's plan for your life. And that's what he's trying to convince Paul of. And so this is a very real concern from Paul from the very beginning. And so now then at the end of his life, as he's writing back to Timothy, his younger self, his son in the ministry, Paul thinks back and he wants Timothy to remember this foundational truth. Timothy, we're saved to serve. Timothy, we're saved to serve. But I want to let you know something, Timothy. The devil is going to fight tooth and nail to keep you from that purpose. He's going to fight tooth and nail to convince you that you have no part of that plan because of the mistakes that you've made. As an older man, Paul thinks back and the mistakes are numerous. Paul thinks back and the mistakes could fill up volumes of things that if he had a do-over, he'd change it. But he wants Timothy to know that there is absolutely no accumulation. There's no degree of sin. There's no longevity of sin that can change the fact that you were saved to serve. God has called you out for a purpose. And folks, before we go any further, I want you to know the same is true for each and every one of us. God didn't save you to sit in a chair. God didn't save you to put your name on a church roll. God didn't save you to have a spot in a Sunday school class potluck. He saved you to serve. Now, For a lot of us, though, we hear that chirping in our ear constantly. You're not good enough. You don't deserve this. Can I just tell you something? We don't. We aren't good enough. We don't deserve it. But thank God the story doesn't end there. Paul knew that every day Satan was trying to throw his past up in his face. So Paul knew that every day Satan was trying to convince him that he had no part in this plan because of the things that he had done. And he knew that the relentless accusations 
We're meant for one purpose and one purpose only. Satan brought him up for the sole purpose of trying to keep Paul from doing what God had created him to do. Sound familiar? There's a lot of us we really feel like God has called us to this or called us to that. He's given me a knack for this. But you know what? I, I can't be a part of that. You don't know what I've done. Maybe not. I don't have to. I can tell you confidently, you were saved to serve. And Paul wanted Timothy to know Satan's tricks on the front end so that he'd be ready to fight against him later. So when we get to this next part of the story in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we see Paul, uh, again, imparting some wisdom to Timothy, his younger self. And it's going to start with this foundational truth, we are saved to serve. So if you got your Bible, we're going to start reading in 1 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 12. This is what Paul tells him. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Now time out. Don't miss that. That's the truth. That is this foundational truth that it's all going to be built upon. What is Paul thankful for? That Jesus saw fit to call him into his service. Before we move any further into this, have you got to that point? Where you realize, you understand that God has called you for a purpose. He has called you into his service it's not negotiable it's not for the you know really elite of the church really elite of the christian no he's called all of us to a place of service paul says i thank god that jesus called me into his service let's see what else he says he says even though oh, you know it's fixing to get good when he starts off with even though even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. Well, that summed it up pretty nicely. A blasphemer, which would have been a big deal to Paul, right? He was a Pharisee of Pharisee, a Jew of Jews. They took God's identity very seriously. And what's Paul confessing? I had it wrong. I had it wrong. I was a blasphemer. I didn't recognize Jesus as God and as his atoning sacrifice. I didn't recognize him. And I fought against him. I was a blasphemer. He says, I was a persecutor. We already talked how he was on his way to Damascus to carry out what he had already done in Jerusalem. He was rounding up church members, Christians, followers of Jesus to put them on trial and ultimately put them to death. He says, I was a persecutor. I was a violent man. Now, I, I, I'm a little bit happy that Paul decided to throw that into his resume here because he could have easily pulled what we do sometimes. Well, it wasn't me. Remember with the stoning of Stephen? And they're sitting there and they're throwing rocks at Stephen and trying to kill him. And what was Saul at the time? What was he doing? I was just holding their coats. It wasn't me. I wasn't throwing any rocks. But he goes, no, I was a violent man. I was one there encouraging them. I was one holding their coats so they could rear back and throw it even harder. He says, I was all of these things. He says, and he still called me into his service. Let's keep going. He says, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We see in this passage Paul continuing to pour out this hard-earned life wisdom to Timothy. And as he looks at Timothy and he, he's writing this letter to him, he wants Timothy to live out God's plan for his life. And he wants him to live it out to the fullest. You see, there's a reason that 
Paul sees a lot of himself in Timothy. He sees a similar calling. He sees some similar tendencies. He sees that God has a grand purpose for this young man. He says, Timothy, man, I know there's already been some things where you messed up. Timothy, I know there's already been some things if you had a do-over, you'd take it. Timothy, but I know there's also going to be a lot more on the horizon that have not happened yet. And Timothy, I don't want you to let that stuff keep you from living out your purpose. I want you to live it to the fullest. And to do that, Timothy was going to have to be grounded in how to deal with failure. This morning, there's many of us that we feel like we're disqualified for, for pursuing God's plan for us. Why? Because of our past. Oh, yeah, I did. And you fill in the blank and you go, because of that, God can't use me. Oh, well, I did this again. God can't use me. And we convince ourselves that we're disqualified because of something that we've done, some mistake that we've made, some failure on our part. And we say, yes, it's great that God has a purpose and a plan for my life, but I can't have any part of it because I've messed up. Paul did not want Timothy to have that as his mindset. Paul didn't want Timothy to go through life settling for something less because he had failed at something. He knew that God was bigger than that. So this morning, as we take a deeper look at this passage, I want us to discover how we can serve for a lifetime, even in the midst of our failure. So how do we deal with it? What is it that we need to do if we want to live God's plan for our life to the fullest, even though we are sinful failures? There's three things this morning we're going to talk about. First one is this. If you want to live God's plan to the fullest, own your mistakes. Anybody here ever made one? Or two, three, four? Look, we're just talking about this morning since you got out of bed. You know, uh, if we started jotting down every mistake, every failure that we had, that's all we would do because there's enough of it to go around to keep us writing for a lifetime. We've got to own our mistakes. Now, here's the thing. How many of you like admitting that you're wrong yeah i didn't think so I, I believe i would rather have my teeth pulled or whatever than to admit when i'm wrong and it's kind of ingrained in us isn't it it's just kind of part of our dna we don't want anybody to know that we've messed up we don't want anybody to know that we have failed we don't want anybody to know about the things where we didn't get it right and so what do we do I'll hide it. I may have to, you know, I'm sorry, and, and make amends as privately as possible. But we don't like owning our mistakes. Here's the problem with that. Satan loves to tempt us, doesn't he? I've not met a single person in my 45 years who would say, oh, I've never been tempted. I, I don't even know what that's like. No, Satan loves to tempt us. He loves to entice us with sinful opportunities. He loves to put that out there, hoping that we will act on it. And guess what he does if we act on it? That same Satan who loved to tempt us on the front end loves to accuse us on the back end. Oh, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you gave in to that. I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were somebody who followed God. I thought you were somebody who loved God. Somebody who really loved him wouldn't do that. And you're going, you're the same one who tempted me with it. But that's how he operates. Satan loves to tempt us on the front end so he can accuse us on the back end. And we are so ashamed of that that our natural instinct is just to hide it. Just hide it. Try and bury it deep. Don't think about it. Don't talk about it. Don't let anybody know. But it's still there, isn't it? The mistake's still there. It's still festering. It's still in our mind. We can't move past it. Why don't we just remove that weapon from Satan's arsenal? Why don't we just remove it so he can't use that against us? And the way we do that is we acknowledge our own sinfulness. What does Scripture say about this? Romans 3.23 tells us that what? 
for all. That's all of us. For those of you who aren't biblical scholars, all means all. Every single one of us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every man, woman, boy, and girl who has ever walked the face of this planet or who ever will is going to sin. Scripture goes on and it tells us in 1 John 1, 1.8. It says, says that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Preacher, where are you going with this? Why do we act like we haven't made mistakes? Why do we act like failure isn't the universal language? Why do we act like we're the only one in the room so we got to hide it and be ashamed of it? Folks, look around. You're in a room full of screw-ups. <laughs> and I mean that with all the love I can muster. Every single one of us has gotten it wrong. We mess up constantly. We do it the wrong way with the wrong motivations. But thank God it doesn't just end at 1 John 1 8. It says, We deceive ourselves if we say we haven't sinned. What's 1 John 1 9 say? But if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just, forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Folks, do you see where I'm going? Do you want to take this weapon out of Satan's arsenal? Quit trying to act like you haven't made a mistake. Quit trying to hide it from everybody. Acknowledge your sin. Confess it. Yeah, I'm not perfect. I am not perfect in the least. That's what Paul did here, isn't it? Look back with us at verse 13. He says, even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy. Paul's saying to Timothy, Timothy, you know who I am. You know some of the things I've done. I've never tried to hide that from you, son. Timothy, in the same way, don't you hide. Don't run from your mistakes. Learn from them, absolutely, but don't run from them. Don't hide from them. Acknowledge it. Own your mistakes. There's going to be a group of people that go, well, you're just celebrating your sin. Hear me. We aren't celebrating our sin when we acknowledge our sinfulness. We're just simply agreeing with Scripture. We're agreeing with Scripture that we are indeed sinful, that I am rotten to my core. We're not celebrating anything. What we're celebrating is the fact that despite of my sinfulness, there's a God that promises me that when I will confess it, not hide it, He will deal with my sin. But I've got to own it first. What we start finding is that when we acknowledge our sin, we confess it, Satan can't throw it in our face. Because when he tries, I get to go, oh, I'm sorry. That one's been dealt with. I've already given that one to the Lord. I've already laid that one at his feet. And guess what? His blood has covered it. There's nothing you can say about it. But the more we hide it, the more we run away from it, the more opportunity we give him to throw it back in our face. Folks, don't let Satan continually hold past failures over your head. Own it. Confess it. That leads us to a question. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, he's going to do what? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can he really do that? Will he really do that? Well, that leads us to the second thing here that Paul tells Timothy. That is, embrace grace. Embrace grace. Notice what it says in verse 14. Well, we'll pick up in 13. It says, uh, even though I was once a sinner, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Time out. Well, we know that when Scripture tells us we were called for a purpose, that it tells us that we were thoroughly equipped, abundantly 
equipped. In other words, you've got more than you could ever possibly need. What's Paul saying here? He was shown grace abundantly. I had a lot of sins to cover up. I had a lot of sins to redeem and atone for. So it was abundantly shown to me. Some of us may feel that same way. I've gotten it wrong so many times. Good, because we serve a God of abundance who's not going to run out of grace. It says, the grace of the Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Again, look around the room. You are a flawed human being in a room full of flawed human beings. Welcome to the club. If it was left up to us to try and fix our own flaws, we would be in a world of hurt. But we're not. You see, we deserved eternal punishment and separation from God for our transgressions. Scripture teaches us that as well. That the wages of sin was death. And death, not just, hey, they're going to lay me six feet in a grave, but death, I'm eternally separated from the God who made me. The God who made me to be in a relationship with him. That is not going to happen. Sin severed that. That's what I deserved. That's what I have earned. But God had other plans. God had other plans for you and I. And through Jesus, he's offered us grace and mercy. I just want you to think about those two words for a minute. Because it's two words that we toss around a lot in church. We'll sing songs that have these words, grace and mercy. We'll see them on bulletin boards. We'll see them in different places. We toss them around freely in church. But do we really understand grace and mercy? Let's see if we can kind of clear it up this morning. What's mercy? We'll start there. Because Paul says, I've been shown mercy. Parents, you ever had to punish your kid? Oh. I always thought my mom was lying when she'd say those famous words. This is going to hurt me more than it does you. Let's just swap roles for a minute and see if that's really the case, okay? This is going to hurt me more than it does you. And I always thought those words were so full of it until I had a kid. And I hate having to punish my daughter. I mean, it just, I'm like, she's so cute. Look at her. I mean, who wants to punish her? I hate having to punish her. And there's times where she absolutely deserves punishment. She's done something wrong. She knows it. She won't deny it. But in that moment, her mom and I will choose to give her something different. We choose to give her mercy. See, mercy's not getting the punishment that I rightly deserve. You ever been shown mercy? powerful isn't it you just wait for somebody just to let you have it because you know in your heart of hearts you've earned it i got it coming and instead of giving you what you had coming instead of getting what you rightfully deserve they chose to give you mercy maybe they forgave you maybe they didn't hold you accountable for a debt whatever it was they gave you mercy Folks, mercy leaves an impression upon us. Because we know that we didn't deserve it. We know what we did deserve, and we didn't have to pay it. Paul says, I was shown mercy. See, Paul was well aware what his punishment should be for all the things that he's done wrong. Could he ever in a million years have worked off all of his mistakes? Could he ever in a million years have racked up enough good behavior to make up for the bad things that he had done? No. He said, I was shown mercy. My slate was wiped clean. 
even though I had done nothing to earn it. So I've shown mercy. But he also talks about how he was uh, shown grace. Grace. Oh, man, that's a good church word. We have amazing grace. We talk about grace a lot. What is grace? Again, I'll talk about my daughter. She loves it when I do this. You ever given your kid something that they did not earn? Y'all, y'all have a chore chart or anything at your house? Natalie, she's a little entrepreneur, and so she likes to earn money. And so her mom and I, we came up with this, this chart that if she does certain things, she gets money for them. There's some things that just that, that's part of her, her, her daily stuff. But if she does this, she gets money. Now, guess what's happened on more than one occasion? Short chart is not completed. But daddy's wallet or mama's wallet still opens up. Did she earn that money? No. Did she do what we said she had to do to get it? No. In that moment, she got grace. Folks, when we think about that in eternal terms, how often do we fall short of the standard that he set for us? Every single day. (laughs) For some of us, minute by minute, we fall short of that standard. But what does he give us instead? Not what I earned by my behavior, not what I earned by my decision, but he gave me grace. He gave me a reward that I have not earned and I will not ever earn. In this passage, Paul says, Timothy, you want to stay in the fight? You want to continue serving even in the midst of failure? You've got to learn to embrace grace, brother. Because if not, your failure is going to convince you that you have no place in this plan. Embrace grace. Embrace grace mercy because you serve a God who pours them out lavishly upon you folks this morning that's where a lot of us are you have convinced yourself that you have no part in God's plan because your mistakes are too frequent your mistakes are too grand your mistakes are too noticeable whatever and Paul's saying no You serve a God of grace and mercy. Get up and get back to work. Get in the the fight. Take part in the plan. That's what he's wanting Timothy to understand. He closes out by reminding Timothy of one last thing. He's told him that he needs to embrace grace. He's told Timothy that he needs to own up to his mistakes. Now then, he's wanting Timothy to remember that your failure and redemption become a part of his story. The very thing that you're so ashamed of, the very thing that you try so hard to hide, become part of his story. Notice what Paul says in verse 16. He says, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners... Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Romans 8, 28 is a verse that a lot of us are familiar with. And what does Romans 8, 28 say? We know that in all things. Again, you don't have to be a biblical scholar here. All means all. So it's not just those moments that I'm proud of that I'm going to pin up on the refrigerator for everybody to see. But in all things, those lowest of low moments where I just soon hide under a rock and nobody ever see me because of the decisions I've just made. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Folks, do you get it? 
do you realize that God knows every single thing about you? Everything. And he's incorporated every hurt, every lie, every failure into his grand story of redemption. Paul testified that God's redeeming work in his life had shown a light on God's patience and grandness. If Paul were standing up here today, I think he'd tell us something like this. If God was willing to save and redeem me, then he can and will for anyone else who's willing to turn to him. And you'd have some smart aleck in the crowd that go, but Paul, what about all those years you spent fighting against Jesus? Paul, what about all those years you spent persecuting the church? And Paul would say, I'm a sinner, no doubt, not going to deny it. But I also know that I've experienced the grace and mercy of a God that will not quit pursuing me. And because of that, I've had an opportunity to tell others about him through my failures. Paul wanted Timothy to understand that while failure was always an option, it would never disqualify him from living out God's purpose for his life. Folks, this morning we need the same reminder. That it doesn't matter how many times we've fallen, how many times we have messed up, God still has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And the fact remains that we were saved to serve that purpose. This morning as we close, I want us to kind of shift our thinking. I want us to consider this. Instead of us wallowing in our failures and just making ourselves feel miserable, instead of convincing ourselves that we have no plan or part in God's plan, instead of convincing ourselves that we don't deserve to be a part of it, what if instead of all of that, instead of letting our failures keep us from serving God, maybe, just maybe, we need to realize that those very failures often give me my greatest platform to serve. Those things that you're the most ashamed of, those failures that you feel are the most glaring, instead of hiding them, instead of being ashamed of them and tucking them in the closet, what if we said, I'm going to raise this flag high. This is what God has saved me from. These are the mistakes he has freed me from. These are the mistakes he has forgiven me of. This is who I am. If God can forgive me, then certainly he can forgive you. What if we quit being so ashamed of being human? What if we quit being so ashamed of being a failure that we said, God, use my failures to make much of you. That's what Paul is trying to get across to Timothy. That's what he's wanting Timothy to see. That from our worst failures, we've learned valuable lessons. Share them. Use them. Be a part of God's plan. This morning, I want to ask you a question as we close. We know that we've all made mistakes. We've all been on the failure side of things. But this morning, will you dare to be vulnerable and let God use your weakness to shine a light on his goodness? Will you dare to be vulnerable enough to say, God, I'm tired of hiding who I am. I'm a sinner saved by grace and I'm tired of trying to act like in anything else. Will you be vulnerable and let God use your failures and your weaknesses to shine upon Him? Let's pray. Father God, this morning, Lord, I readily admit that I am a sinner. God, whether it be my attitudes and my actions, Lord, my words and my thoughts, God, I'm a sinner. Lord, I 
know how daily Satan attempts to use my mistakes against me. God, you've called me to a purpose. Lord, he doesn't get a say-so in that. So, Father, I pray for myself this morning. Lord, I pray for each and every person here. That, God, as we own up to our mistakes, we own up to our sinfulness, and, Lord, we just realize that we serve a God of grace and mercy who's lavishly pouring it out upon us and continually pursuing us. God, we'll realize that you want to use the worst moments of our life to shine brightly upon yourself. Lord, if there's any of us this morning that Lord, right now we find ourselves just wallowing in the pit. God, today would be the day that we turn it over to you. Lord, we take that weapon away from Satan and God, we jump jump back in the fight and we start living out the purpose you've given us to live. Lord, as we go into this time of response, I just pray that you speak loud and clear to every heart here. God, I don't know what decisions are to be made. Lord, I don't know what uh, or what walls need to come down. But God, we trust that you do. So God, we pray that you'd move us in that direction. So God, right now, would you just have your will and your way in each and every heart here. Lord, we love you and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Of deliverance of my enemies to all my fears, oh God. I'm no longer a slave to fear, oh, I am a child. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. From my mother's womb. Chosen me, love has called my name. I've been born again into your family, your blood flows through my veins. Cause I'm no longer.
And folks, this morning, that is exactly where we find ourselves. You don't have to be a 